Section 6 of The Day Boy and the Night Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Day Boy and the Night Girl. The Romance of Photogen and Nycteris. By George MacDonald. Chapter 16 to 17. Chapter 16. An Evil Nurse. Watho was herself ill, as I have said, and was the worst tempered, and besides it is a peculiarity of witches that what works in others to sympathy works in them to repulsion. Also Watho had a poor, helpless, rudimentary spleen of a conscience left, just enough to make her uncomfortable, and therefore more wicked. So when she heard that Photogen was ill, she was angry. Ill, indeed! after all she had done to saturate him with the life of the system, with the solar might itself? He was a wretched failure, the boy, and because he was her failure, she was annoyed with him, began to dislike him, grew to hate him. She looked on him as a painter might upon a picture, or a poet upon a poem, which he had only succeeded in getting into an irrecoverable mess. In the hearts of witches, love and hate lie close together, and often tumble over each other. And whether it was that her failure with Photogen foiled also her plans in regard to Nycteris, or that her illness made her yet more of a devil's wife, certainly Watho now got sick of the girl too, and hated to know her about the castle. She was not too ill, however, to go to poor Photogen's room and torment him. She told him she hated him like a serpent, and hissed like one as she said it looking very sharp in the nose and chin, and flat in the forehead. Photogen thought she meant to kill him, and hardly ventured to take anything brought to him. She ordered every ray of light to be shut out of his room, but by means of this he got a little used to the darkness. She would take one of his arrows, and now tickle him with the feather end of it, now prick him with the point till the blood ran down. What she meant finally I cannot tell, but she brought Photogen speedily to the determination of making his escape from the castle. What he should do then, he would think afterwards. Who could tell but he might find his mother somewhere beyond the forest? If it were not for the broad patches of darkness that divided day from day, he would fear nothing. But now, as he lay helpless in the dark, ever and anon would come dawning through it the face of the lovely creature who on that first awful night nursed him so sweetly. Was he never to see her again? If she was, as he had concluded, the nymph of the river, why had she not reappeared? She might have taught him not to fear the night, for plainly she had no fear of it herself. But then, when the day came, she did seem frightened. Why was that, seeing there was nothing to be afraid of then? Perhaps one so much at home in the darkness was correspondingly afraid of the light. Then his selfish joy at the rising of the sun, blinding him to her condition, had made him behave to her in ill return for her kindness as cruelly as Watho behaved to him. How sweet and dear and lovely she was! If there were wild beasts that came out only at night, and were afraid of the light, why should there not be girls, too, made the same way, who could not endure the light, as he could not bear the darkness? If only he could find her again— Ah, how differently he would behave to her! But, alas, perhaps the sun had killed her, melted her, burned her up, dried her up, that was it, if she was the nymph of the river. CHAPTER Seventeen: WATHO'S WOLF From that dreadful morning Nycteris had never got to be herself again. The sudden light had been almost death to her, and now she lay in the dark with the memory of a terrific sharpness, a something she dared scarcely recall, lest the very thought of it should sting her beyond endurance. But this was as nothing to the pain which the recollection of the rudeness of the shining creature whom she had nursed through his fear caused her, for the moment his suffering passed over to her and he was free, the first use he made of his returning strength had been to scorn her. She wondered and wondered. It was all beyond her comprehension. Before long Watho was plotting evil against her. The witch was like a sick child, weary of his toy. She would pull her to pieces and see how she liked it. She would set her in the sun and see her die like a jelly from the salt ocean cast out on a hot rock. 
It would be a sight to soothe her wolf pain. One day, therefore, a little before noon, while Nycteris was in her deepest sleep, she had a darkened litter brought to the door, and in that she made two of her men carry her to the plain above. There they took her out, laid her on the grass, and left her. Watho watched it all from the top of her high tower through her telescope, and scarcely was Nycteris left when she saw her sit up, and the same moment cast herself down again with her face to the ground. "'She'll have a sunstroke,' said Watho, "'and that'll be the end of her.' Presently, tormented by a fly, a huge humped buffalo, with a great shaggy mane, came galloping along, straight for where she lay. At the sight of the thing on the grass, he started, swerved yards aside, stopped dead, and then came slowly up, looking malicious. Nycteris lay quite still, and never even saw the animal. "'Now she'll be trodden to death,' said Watho. "'That's the way those creatures do.' When the buffalo reached her, he sniffed at her all over, and went away, then came back and sniffed again, then all at once went off as if a demon had him by the tail. Next came a new, a more dangerous animal still, and did much the same. Then a gaunt wild boar. But no creature hurt her, and Watho was angry with the whole creation. At length, in the shade of her hair, the blue eyes of Nycteris began to come to themselves a little, and the first thing they saw was a comfort. I have told already how she knew the night daisies, each a sharp-pointed little cone with a red tip, and once she had parted the rays of one of them with trembling fingers, for she was afraid she was dreadfully rude, and perhaps was hurting it. But she did want, she said to herself, to see what secret it carried so carefully hidden, and she found its golden heart. But now, right under her eyes, inside the veil of her hair, in the sweet twilight of whose blackness she could see it perfectly, stood a daisy with its red tip opened wide into a carmine ring, displaying its heart of gold on a platter of silver. She did not at first recognize it as one of those cones come awake, but a moment's notice revealed what it was. Who then could have been so cruel to the lovely little creature as to force it open like that, and spread it heart bare to the terrible death-lamp? Whoever it was, it must be the same that had thrown her out there to be burned to death in its fire. But she had her hair, and could hang her head, and make a small sweet night of her own about her. She tried to bend the daisy down and away from the sun, and to make its petals hang about it like her hair. But she could not. Alas, it was burned and dead already. She did not know that it could not yield to her gentle force, because it was drinking life, with all the eagerness of life, from what she called the death-lamp. Oh, how the lamp burned her! But she went on thinking, she did not know how, and by and by began to reflect that, as there was no roof to the room except that in which the great fire went rolling about, the little red tip must have seen the lamp a thousand times, and must know it quite well, and it had not killed it. Nay, thinking about farther, she began to ask the question whether this, in which she now saw it, might not be its more perfect condition. For not only now did the whole seem perfect, as indeed it did before, but every part showed its own individual perfection as well, which perfection made it capable of combining with the rest into the higher perfection of a whole. The flower was a lamp itself, the golden heart was the light, and the silver border was the alabaster globe, skillfully broken and spread wide to let out the glory. Yes, the radiant shape was plainly its perfection. If, then, it was the lamp which had opened it into that shape, the lamp could not be unfriendly to it, but must be of its own kind, seeing it made it perfect. And again, when she thought of it, there was clearly no little resemblance between them. What if the flower, then, was the little great-grandchild of the lamp, and he was loving it all the time? And what if the lamp did not mean to hurt her, only could not help it? The red tips looked as if the flower had some time or other been hurt. What if the lamp was making the best it could of her, opening her out somehow like the flower? She would bear it patiently and see. But how coarse the color of the grass was! Perhaps, however, her eyes not being made for the bright lamp, she did not see them as they were. Then she remembered how different were the eyes of the creature that was not a girl and was afraid of the darkness. 
Ah, if the darkness would only come again, all arms, friendly and soft, everywhere about her, she would wait and wait, and bear, and be patient. She lay so still that Watho did not doubt she had fainted. She was pretty sure she would be dead before the night came to revive her. End of section 6